As I mentioned earlier, an effective way to remember God's faithfulness in your life is to use every opportunity to tell people about what God has done in your life. To recount is simply to tell someone about something or give an account of an event or experience. So why don't all of us say together, recount? Recount. If you're online type, recount as well. And many of us, we have a story of encountering God of experiencing His healing and provision, of returning back to God, or even having received Jesus into our lives for the first time. There are some powerful stories of being redeemed by God. And you know what? A lot of these stories, they can happen at a grace retreat as well. And these could be your stories. All of these events that you go through become your stories to tell others about God. God allows you to go through that so that others may come to know Him through your stories. In Joshua 3, we read in detail about how the Israelites crossed the Jordan. In Joshua 4, we read in detail about how they set up the 12 memorial stones taken from the Jordan. So now, I'd like to point you to verse 19 and 20 of chapter 4 after they had done what Joshua commanded them to do with the 12 stones. Now pay attention to the mention of Gilgal. The people came out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho and those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. So the first time these 12 stones were set up, it was at Gilgal. They were now encamped at Gilgal after completing the setup of the memorial stones. So once again, Joshua gave almost identical instructions about the purposes of these stones. We've read it before. I want to read it again. When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Now in the next chapter, we read in detail about a new generation of Israelites being circumcised. Now who are they? If we go on to chapter 5, verse 7, we know who they are. It was their children, that means the Israelites' children, whom Joshua raised up, whom he raised up in their place, that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way to the promised land. So by now, all the males who had left Egypt as adults, they had died in the desert. And so you had a new generation of people who were uncircumcised, which is why they were circumcised en masse. And there were two reasons for their circumcision. First, it was to remove the shame of their slavery in Egypt as described in verse 9 of chapter 5. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal means rolled away. The removal of the shame of slavery was to become God's chosen people. That means they were no longer the, the people from Egypt, right? They were now God's chosen people. And this removal of shame was a covenant sign to Israel. The second reason for the circumcision was that in verse 10, it tells us that it was Passover that they were about to celebrate next. And this was a key tradition in Israel. So verse 10 reads, While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. Now we do a little bit of a throwback to Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. It will tell us that circumcision was a prerequisite for males observing the Passover. Now, circumcision was a, a sign of the covenant between God and His people. It was a physical symbol of the people's commitment to follow God's commands as part of God's requirements of being in the covenantal community. So now, when we look at these two verses together, verse 10 from chapter 5 and verse 19 from chapter 4, the phrase, encamped at Gilgal, should instantly link these two together for you in your mind where the Israelites had just set up the 12 memorial stones and they were told what to do with it in chapter 4, verse 19. So if we were to even go back to an earlier tradition in Exodus 12, 
verse 26 and 27, it describes what the Israelites would do during Passover. And this instruction that Moses gave to the people sounds strikingly similar, similar to what Joshua commanded the Israelites to do in the previous chapter. So these are the words of Moses. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the, Lord, it, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses and the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Now, observe here that the Israelites didn't have to wait too long to obey God's instructions in Joshua chapter 4 about telling their children about what God has done. In fact, when they kept this Passover tradition in chapter 5 verse 10, they had to recount what happened in Egypt a long time ago or one generation ago and all the events that led up to the crossing of the Red Sea. That was the previous generation's miracle and experience of God's deliverance. And now, as generations of Israelites sat at Gilgal, staring straight at the 12 memorial stones, the Israelites here added another event to their archive of testimonies, which is the crossing of the Red Sea, or crossing of the Jordan. It now, in their repertoire of stories to tell the next generation, they added, we had crossed the Red Sea. Now we have crossed the Jordan. This is our common experience. So what was happening here is that each time they saw the 12 memorial stones, they would be recounting for others what God had done for them in and beyond Egypt through their wilderness journeys and now into the land that God had promised them. There was a lot of stories that they were recounting for each other. Now, you know, there are a few testimonies in my life that I will never get tired of recounting and retelling. It could be my conversion story. Maybe some of you know it. Or it could be how my mom released me to come into full-time ministry. Or it could be how God provided our first home for my wife and I. Or it could be God's ongoing provisions for my two children. Or it could be how God healed my mother-in-law of leukemia. Or how my mom and dad-in-law came to the Christian faith. You know, I praise God that in what I do, uh, in, in my full-time calling, I get a chance to recount and retell these testimonies, not just within grace, but outside of grace as well. And not just to Gracians and Christians, but also to non-believers like my neighbours, like my friends at the gym or like my friends in reservists, and even in the last few years, to the parents of my children's classmates. When we hang out together, whether they are Christian or not, I will tell them what God has done in my family, in my life, in my ministry. And so telling people about what God has done and is doing in my life, it never gets old because it constantly reminds people that God has been actively involved with people. And you know, something that I treasure a lot in my daily routines are solo car rides with my kids especially when I pick them up from school. You know, I get a chance to hear how their day went. I'm the first person to hear how their day went. And I, get a, I also get an opportunity to speak into how their day went. And it is in my hope that in these moments, I get a chance to speak life and love into my children's inner being and build resilience and gratitude into their hearts. My wife and I will always remember what they shared the day before and we will pray specifically for them the next morning when we send them to school together. And so in this particular way, our car rides have become a kind of memorial stone of sorts for my wife and I, but also for my two children. And even when, my helper, when our helper sits into the car with us, we also get her to pray along with us and we ask her to pray in her heart language. So sometimes she will break out into dialect or sometimes she will break out into Tagalog, which is a heart language, okay? And from time to time, when she prays, she will pray until she cries. And then my children will be looking at her, what is happening, you know? Like, why is Ate crying? Like, elder sister, why is Ate crying? And then they will comfort Ate, you know, Ate is okay, you don't need to cry, even though they have, they have no idea what she's saying. And you see, this has become our memorial stone. Praying in the car was a habit that we picked up 
from our marriage mentors many, many years ago. And their memorial stone has now become our memorial stone. And this is a way that we get a chance to tell Gratians in the next generation, our, our own two children, about what God has done in our lives. So Gratians, who are the next generation of people that you must recount of what God has done in your lives? Who are they? I want to speak to those who have children. For those with children, I invite you to parent them in the ways of the Lord. It is not easy, but God's grace is sufficient for you and His power is made perfect in your weaknesses and your shortcomings. But you know what? The next generation also includes spiritual children. For some of you who are wondering, I, I don't have children of my own, can I just remind you that there are literally hundreds of children in Grace Assembly. And they, a lot of them, they are right now at level two, right across our little, you know, Jordan River to Emmaus. They, they, they come to church for services on Saturday. There are literally hundreds of next generation Gratians that you can share your life with, waiting for you to testify to. Maybe some of you who are in grace groups, maybe you can intentionally take time during your grace group to testify what God has done in your life in the week. Be deliberate about this and come prepared to share a testimony. We have an opportunity to speak life and to speak love into each other and to help each other build our faith in God. Imagine if all of us did that in grace groups. In a couple of years, all of you here would have heard hundreds of testimonies if we did that every week. I also want to speak to those who have non-believers in their family. It could be your children. It could be your parents. It could be your grandparents. Or maybe a tan attic somewhere in your relative line. It could be your auntie, your uncle, your godfather, godbrother. It doesn't matter. There might be a non-believer in your family. Ask God to help you to identify someone you should pray for and eventually testify of God's faithfulness too. And for most of us here who have a social media account, <clears throat> maybe it is as simple as sharing a Bible verse, a faith quote, or a Christian article, reshare it. Anything that will help your followers think about God. For those of you who have no social media account and you are at office, at, uh, you, you go to office or you go to somewhere outside, every, anywhere, maybe you can set aside Tuesdays to be Testimony Tuesdays. Anyone that you eat lunch with on a Tuesday, you share your testimony with them. Or maybe you can set aside, tell people about God Thursdays. And every time you have lunch with anyone that you're with, you will tell them about, about what God is doing in your life. Make it a part of your weekly routine and eating habits. You see, testifying of God's faithfulness to the next generation, it can feel like a tall order, but it is not as difficult as you think it is. It simply means recounting for others what God has done. Recounting for others what God has done in your life and using every opportunity to help someone know God, hear about God, be reminded about God. You know, it's not always about conversion, but it's always about helping someone take one step closer to Jesus. Would you turn to someone beside you and say, I will recount. I will recount. And those of you who are online, type in, I will recount. <clears throat> See, Gracians, Joshua instructed the Israelites in his time through the 12 memorial stones to remember for themselves what God has done and to also recount for others what God has done. Joshua and his generation, they had to cross a river. They had to return to the river that they crossed to get 12 stones from it. They had to circumcise an entire generation. They had to help their next generation remember God and what God has done for them. My friends, we don't have to cross a river. We don't have to pick out stones from a riverbed. We don't have to circumcise a generation. 
And you know what? With today's technology, we have far more opportunities to tell other people about God's faithfulness than the Israelites ever did. And maybe, maybe for some of us, you can begin that story of telling others about what God has done in your life by simply saying, this reminds me of a story. So don't miss this. Don't miss this, friends. God wants us to testify of His faithfulness to the next generation. We must use every opportunity to testify of 